Hello everyone, this is Norm. Glad you could join me for today's video. There's no script today, so you might as well just settle in. All you're getting today is me, raw, unfiltered. Am I wearing pants? Not disclosing that. I just thought it'd be nice to have an evening where you and I, that's you in the sense of however many people are watching this, get to spend a little quality time together. Learn a little bit more about each other. You can put your part in the comments, I might read them later. As for me, well, uh, if the plan goes right, you're probably seeing a, a windowed image of a work in progress. I'm actually recording this before I'm finished with that part of it, so uh, depending on how well that part, how the actual recording process goes, that may or may not make it into the final edit. We're going to pretend right now that you're seeing me working on a, a new cartoon. Please allow that to distract you from my clearly unscripted monologue. Anyway, yes, why am I doing this? Why am I subjecting you to an entire video of excruciatingly unscripted, off-the-cuff monologue, complete with us, ers, and Shatner pauses? The answer, dear audience, is that I want a deeper connection. I want to be a part of your routine. I want to be part of your lives. No, that's not true at all, actually. Uh, the truth is that that it takes a long time to put together the kind of videos that I normally post. Where you know, uh, any kind of custom art obviously is a terrifyingly long scale pro prospect, especially if you're not doing it uh, AI or outsourcing to any other gullible creators. Anyway, the point of the matter is that uh, that YouTube does not like that kind of video. I mean, they don't necessarily have a grudge against it, but they're not going to do anything to push it because it's, uh, from their standpoint, the wrong kind of video. What they want is something that uh, something fairly long, uploaded very quickly, regularly, because from their standpoint, the content of the video really doesn't matter, except as it, you know, anything that would keep them from monetizing it. But from their standpoint, a five-minute video that took two years to create is going to be worth exactly how many eyeballs are on it for that duration. If the engagement numbers are the same, then it doesn't matter if it's a video of somebody's weasel taking a bath or, or the collected works of Orson Welles. And before you make any assumptions, weasel bath videos do numbers. In any case, the videos that we normally do, the videos that I like to do, they are the wrong type of videos from YouTube's standpoint. What YouTube wants are personalities. Somebody is going to sidle up to the microphone and fill some airtime for a set number of minutes and do so reliably. And that's not to disparage the noble art of talking into a microphone. It isn't particularly easy to fill up airtime unscripted. Just be thankful that you're getting the version of this recording with all the long pauses edited out. In any case, long story short, I'm doing this video as a compromise to the algorithm. Since I'm going to be working on art anyway, I might as well record myself doing it and then talk over it and then offer it up to you. And if you're with me so far, then the scheme is working. With that said, the art that you're seeing is art in progress, so uh, you might at the very least be able to get a preview of stuff that's going to be coming around at some point. I, I uh, For this particular video, I don't know what I'm working on. That is, I, I don't know what is being shown right now because I'm recording the audio before I've actually recorded the art part of it, so it may or may not be something shoe and chan related. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's coming soon. And presumably, if we end up doing more of these videos, which I, I assume I'm probably going to do, just fair warning, then I might be able to sync them up to some sort of uh, reasonable schedule and give you more insight into what's being done. Uh, you may wonder why I don't simply talk over myself, uh, like, in real time doing the art, and the answer to that is, that would be so excruciatingly boring for you. You have no idea. Plus, I'm, it's not like I am uh, have any kind of rich inner monologue while I'm working. Generally, if I'm actually involved in the process, if I'm actually uh, making any kind of real progress on an art piece, then I'm in some kind of a tunnel vision haze, just thousand-yard stare, no longer forming coherent thoughts in my mind, occasionally making strange guttural noises like you'd hear coming out of a beagle. No, that is not suitable entertainment. 
In any case, I'm here, you're still here, apparently, for some reason. So, here, no other choice but to serve you up some Norm and his thoughts on the day. So, what's been going on in the wide world? Well, uh, in the in the nerd realm, which I assume you're probably... I mean, I don't want to make assumptions about anybody who'll be watching this, but let's be honest, you're here, you're not doing something better. So, in the nerd realm, one of the big things that's been going on this past week has been a uh, an enormous to-do in regards to... Uh, Wizards of the Coast, uh, that is, the, the the makers and rights holders of the Dungeons and Dragons tabletop gaming franchise. Now, presumably, like I said, if you're if you are nerd adjacent, you have probably already heard some of what's going on with this. So I'm not going to summarize here. There are a million other sources that will go into uh, detail on it. But uh, for a quick overview. And uh, just as a caveat, I don't actually play Dungeons & Dragons. That may surprise you. I'm not a tabletop gamer. Uh, it seems like something I would enjoy, but there are two major strikes against it. The first one being that it takes a lot of time, and the second one being that it takes other people. And uh, I don't know the average age of the listener here, but once you become an adult, scheduling something with other people is an absolute nightmare. It just doesn't happen under normal circumstances. I remember distinctly, I remember, when I was uh, a kid, a teenager, I'm not going to point out exactly when that was, but I vividly recall thinking how much better it would be when I was an adult and could set my own schedule for recreational activities. Needless to say, I was an utter fool. If you have any kind of job responsibilities or uh, any kind of obligations to family, then you really don't have free time in the traditional sense. You have brief reprieves and you cannot count on them being schedulable. Anyway, we're getting off topic. Uh, what we're talking about here is Dungeons & Dragons, and specifically the Open Gaming License. Now, it's a little difficult to give a condensed uh, explanation of what the Open Gaming License is, uh, or at the least how it's very significant to the, to the issue at hand here, without taking you down into the basements and sitting there with scrolls like Gandalf peering over them for 20 minutes and pointing out the relevant histories. Basically, Dungeons & Dragons was was initially crafted by a bunch of nerds. Uh, that's It is a very nerd-centric hobby. It was made by nerds, it's played by nerds, and there was at the at the start when when it was more or less a grassroots organization a uh, kind of class solidarity among the nerds an understanding of the the principles that helped the game to grow that is the makers of dungeons and dragons they knew that when they uh, when people were DMing a game, they were going off script, they were adding stuff to the game, people were writing their own adventures, incorporating parts of the official lore, and there sort of arose this kind of uh, cottage industry around Dungeons & Dragons with fan-made supplemental materials, you know, stuff released for profit in, in some cases, they, like they would actually sell the adventures. Uh, incorporate the D&D &D rule set into their own games, bring over D&D &D specific races, stuff that uh, by, by the normal standards would be considered, well, in most situations, it would be considered breach of copyright. However, the D&D &D creators uh, understood that, the, that this kind of uh, fan action was actually beneficial to the larger platform, and they set out to create the Open Gaming License, a framework under which these fan activities, even uh, even commercial ventures incorporating the D&D lore and rule sets, could be legally used. Anyway, uh, this is getting too deep into the history of it, but the big the big operable parts here is that the Open Gaming License, the OGL, uh, did two major things. First, it made it legal to create your own derivative works using elements of the Dungeons & Dragons rule set. And second, and this is kind of the, uh, the, the one you want to pay attention to, is that it also made these permissions functionally permanent. It explicitly laid out that the license as it was written could not be revoked. That is to say that they explicitly laid out, explicitly like when they were questioned on this, because it, it does seem awfully good-natured for any kind of commercial venture, uh, so when they were explicitly questioned on this in previous years, 
they came right out and said that if, uh, even if they made a change to the gaming license later on, people were still free to use the earlier license uh, and anything that was released under it. And because of that kind of bedrock foundation that the OGL laid, it has been incorporated into a massive number of commercial ventures, and non-commercial ventures, of course, but stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think were, were pulling from the license, like, uh, like I think, some of the Star Wars video games, the uh, RPGs have incorporated the OGL, obviously some of the larger RPG tabletop publishers, uh, like the makers of Pathfinder, and of course scores and scores and scores of basic uh, everyday folks like you and me who just wanted to add on stuff to their, uh, to their games. What I'm trying to convey here is that you would not get this scale of investment into this ecosystem if these organizations, these people, did not feel that the OGL was exactly as irrevocable as the, uh, as the makers said that it was going to be. You really would not be basing your livelihood on a license agreement that, that you felt was in danger of being changed or completely revoked at any given time. Anyway, you can probably guess where this was all heading. As we've seen countless times within the video game sphere, current management believes that they're not squeezing enough money out of their player base, and so management announced that they were planning to change the OGL. Given the community's reliance on the OGL, this went over just about as well as you can imagine. Now again, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the whole back and forth on this issue, because it is extremely involved. There's a lot of stuff. If you're interested, there's a lot of uh, a lot of content on the interwebs right now that you can check and get a full picture of exactly what's going on. But the short version and the part that I want to talk about is how spectacularly this ill-conceived plan has backfired on the makers. And a huge part of this is just the D&D audience, the player base themselves. Like in, in video game terms, we are so used to companies being sleazy and horrible that it's, it is par for the course. If, uh, if Call of Duty announced that their new season pass was going to cost $99 and require you to get a, a microchip implanted in the base of your neck, there'd definitely be some backlash, but at the same time, a significant portion of the player base would be like, eh, what else is new? And that's just the modern state of gaming. We expect the companies to be terrible. Now, I'm not suggesting that that expectation is significantly different for, uh, for tabletop gamers, but there is one significant difference between the player bases, and that is that Wizards of the Coast was trying to pull this crap on a player base that, for fun, mind you, goes page by page through rule sets daily. That's what they do in their off time, to relax. For most video gamers, the first time that we'd find out that there was a clause in the EU LA that gave them access to our kidneys would be when we saw the donor truck pulling up to our front door. Our approach to contracts is pretty much just nihilistic fatalism at this point. But D&D &D players, they are a different sort. Following the initial backlash, Wizards of the Coast released a, uh, a series of kind of backpedaling not entirely honest statements, trying to walk back some of the bigger uh, contentious issues on the on the contracts that were uh, sent out. And in so doing, they've given a, uh, a new sample contract for a, a, a new revision of the gaming license that they say is supposed to uh, supposed to address a lot of these concerns. And what is beautiful about this situation is that every time the company releases a new statement to kind of backpedal over this and uh, try to give a, a, a new spin on the situation, the player base immediately sees through it. Like, I guess it's not surprising, but it turns out there are a lot of lawyers who play D&D. &D. And so with each new iteration, of their terrible gaming license revisions, these guys are just picking them apart, just absolutely demolishing them as they leave the gate. And there is astounding solidarity among the uh, the D&D player base. Like on the video game side of things, it doesn't matter how terrible the new policy is going to be, there's going to be at least a few people in the comments 
who are strongly, not just not just uh, saying, you know, I can understand it, but strongly vehemently defending the company. If Activision announces a new loot box system where there's a 10% chance of getting a legendary item, but a 30% chance of getting a rabbit badger down your trousers, these guys are going to be in the comments shouting down all the people who are complaining about going like, we guess you don't understand how it takes to run a business now. And the reason they would do this to their own detriment, the reason these people will defend an obviously bad, obviously harmful policy is because they have made that game so much a part of their identity that attacking it is tantamount to attacking them. And you'd think the same would be true for the D&D player base. You'd think because they are so deeply invested in the ecosystem that you'll be seeing the same kind of numbers um, defending on the other side. But no, uh, response has been pretty universally against the company in this regard. And I had to think about this one a little bit, but I, I think I've come to a pretty solid conclusion here. And it's that while they do clearly incorporate the D&D game uh, as a major part of their identity, they don't associate the game with the company that provides it. That is, I think the D&D player base knows instinctively on, on a very basic level, and likely the original OGL had a, a significant part to do with this, but they understand that the game that they love, the one that they identify with, is a product of the community rather than the company. And that is something that the current company's leadership did not reckon on it. I understand that there's a, uh, a few members of senior staff who have come over from the video game industry, and I have a feeling that they were unprepared for that. They, uh, they're so used to being the sole source for the, for the ecosystem that they thought that they had the same level of control over it. And what they're seeing now is that they really don't. In fact, insofar as the term is applicable, I can go ahead and make a prediction here. The fans in this particular case are going to win. Now, whether that win consists of the company actually backing down on their terrible idea, or the player base just abandoning D&D entirely and going somewhere where they're more appreciated, that I really cannot say, but I, I can say that right now the D&D leadership is understanding that they do not have the power to just take their ball and go home. They're going to need to find a compromise because the balance of power is not in their hands. Anyway, that's about all the thoughts I have on the D&D debacle, and uh, uh, for right now, I think there's about as many thoughts as I'm going to be pushing into this first episode. Like I said, I don't have any of the other parts ready yet, so I'm going to be editing for a while to see how this turns out. Hopefully I'll be able to parlay the mistakes of today into a more polished second episode. But for now, I'm Norm Scott, and I will see you later. Like the video, video gamers? We have more such wonders to show you, and all you have to do is subscribe and hit the notifications button. I mean, you don't have to. Also consider becoming a patron by following the link to our Patreon page, where we turn your cash into videos, comics, and games using the darkest of dark magics. But mostly just cash.